Okay, so this topic of the Ten Commandments, this came up a couple of weeks ago in my heart. I was talking to somebody who was telling me about a pastor that was reprimanded for his teaching of the Ten Commandments. We got into a discussion about it, and I thought more and more about it, and it stuck with me, and it was on my heart to discuss it. I mean, we start today by asking a simple question that's right there on the screen. Are Christians still subject to the Ten Commandments? It may, and I know this may seem like a no-brainer. You know, most of us would say, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously. Obviously we are. But there is a school of thought um, out there that teaches that because of several things Paul said, primarily in the book of Romans, that we are no longer subject to the Ten Commandments because we're now covered by grace through Jesus Christ. As Christians, when the topic of rules comes up, it's sort of a common reaction to, whether you know it or not, to think about the Ten Commandments. It's the most globally recognized set of rules in existence. And we recognize the need for a rule of law to have standards for maintaining a civilized society with justice and fairness for all people. We need that. And, and sometimes we don't agree with the commandment maybe when it, uh, it, it has to apply to us, right? <laughs> we're not so eager maybe to support it if it's going against something we're trying to accomplish. But there are many pastors and theologians who teach and believe that Christians are not subject to the laws of Moses because they're Old Testament. They teach that since Jesus fulfilled Old Testament law, it's no longer necessary to, to really observe these because Jesus is the law of Moses incarnate. The problem with teaching that Christians are no longer subject to the Ten Commandments, there's a few problems, um, regardless of what their rationale is, it causes Christians to justify breaking their commandments. Well, Jesus knows me. He knows my heart. I'm covered by grace. He died for my sins. I'm okay. Uh, he'll understand. Jesus will judge me. Jesus will judge me. Jesus already did judge you, <laughs> and he already judged me because Jesus is God. And the truth is uh, that you, you, you were judged. You were judged, and this penalty's death. It's for me too. It's death. We were judged. We're not, we're not absolved of that. But Jesus paid the price, and that's, that's the important thing to, to understand. I'm going to read through Exodus 20. And I'm going to make a couple of stops. Exodus 20 is the Ten Commandments. I'm going to make a couple of stops in there to, to highlight a couple of areas um, that may need explained. I'm not going to expand too far on these, but they're important pit stops. So in Exodus 20, it says, And God spoke, to, spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall make not for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above the earth and beneath the waters below. You shall not bow to them and worship them. That's where legalists don't want you to have a statue or a picture of Jesus because they don't read the whole thing in the original text. But you're not to make it for yourself for the purpose of praying to or worshiping it. If your daughter makes a statue of a lion in Sunday school, she's not a heretic. Um, it's, it's, that's, that's a legalistic thing. I don't want to go too far down that road. But anyway, we're not to make graven idols. Uh, then we go down to seven. You shall not misuse the name of your, the Lord your God in vain. The Lord will not hold uh, anyone guiltless who misuses his name, which is a more ac accurate uh, translation. Now, I just want to say this real quick about this, because a lot of people think that taking the Lord's name in vain is just saying that swear word that we all know, and it's not. It's, and it's not only just saying, when people go, well, I swear to God, or 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 when they or when they go, oh my God, I mean, the, I'm, and I'm quoting these things. So those are bad. You're not supposed to do those things. But it's also taking the Lord's name in vain. If you don't go to church, you don't have fellowship, you don't accept Jesus Christ, and you're out in the world going, well, Lord willing, or if the good Lord says, if you if you're good Lord this and good Lord that, and talking about praising Jesus, but you have no life reflecting a relationship with Christ at all in your real life, that is also taking the Lord's name in vain. God willing, God bless you. If you don't care about God, you have nothing to do with God, and you have no relationship with God, but you talk about God, that is actually a more common uh, and more offensive way to take the Lord's name in vain. You're not treating it as sacred and holy and... and you know, a lot of people do that, and it's an important thing for us to remember because even as Christians, we do it. I do. I know I've done it. I've done it passively, and not. Th and then I thought later, 
you know, that was, uh, wasn't like what someone would immediately recognize as outright blasphemy, but, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's to remember to, when we're talking about God to keep it sacred, holy, and respectful. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Seventh day is the Sabbath to your Lord God. On it you shall not do any work, neither knew your son or daughter, nor your male nor female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your town. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that's in it. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now, if you look on the handout, you will see it's the only commandment that says nullified next to it. It was canceled in Colossians 2, 16 through 17, remembering the Sabbath. And before you call me a heretic, <laughs> just hear me out. It, it, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, as, as far, remember, I, and you're going to hear me say this a lot. Jesus never downplayed or, or diminished any Old Testament r r laws. He only raised them to a higher standard. He did that here as well. He, the, the, he didn't admonish it, but it was the purpose behind it, why it's used, and it's no longer on the seventh day, it's now on the first day. Colossians 2, 16, 17 says, therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival or a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. This commandment was also brought to a higher standard by Christ. So for everyone who thinks, I can get out of going to church now, that isn't what it means. The Sabbath was initially observed and obeyed to think of God and meditate and focus on God as our creator and as our law giver. That's what it was in the Old Testament. But then God enters the world. Jesus enters the world and not only is law giver and creator, but is also now savior. So he is now Savior, Lawgiver, Creator. Old Testament observe the Sabbath. Yes, he enters the world. Now he is Savior, which is why the day of worship and celebrating God is on Resurrection Day. It's on day one. So you see, it's not admonished out of God's character and out of God's giving us in law. It is raised to a higher standard. So that's what it is. God is still to be observed as creator and lawgiver. Now, Savior is the most part of the equation. And the passage starts out clearly telling us not to judge. Not to judge. Don't judge. Don't let anyone judge you by what you drink or what day of Sabbath on. That's why when you hear people say, well, I worship God on Saturdays and it should it be Sundays. And you can get into that discussion if you want, but I don't. I mean, it's, it's not worth it. If, if the person um, between them and God and they have a relationship and they have a day for Sabbath, you know, that's good. That's good. Jesus said uh, about the Sabbath, when I, when I was talking about Paul just saying, it says, don't judge. He said, the Sabbath was made for man, not the man for Sabbath. So, so I hope, I'm not going to park too long here because I'm, I could spend a whole sermon on that. I hope you understand what I'm explaining about this. If you don't, I'll be willing to talk to you about it uh, after the service or anytime you'd like. Then we move on. Honor your father and your mother. This is the only one that comes with a blessing, by the way. So that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. And then you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or his female servant, his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, at the end of these Ten Commandments, you know what's missing? What's missing is God saying, until further notice. God never says, these are the commandments until further notice. It's not there. <laughs> it's not there because it's not until further notice. God doesn't change. He doesn't change his character. He would one day come into the world as Jesus Christ, take every one of these commandments and raise the standard for them, not wipe them off the slate. The problem with twisting scripture is that people think they have the licentiousness to ignore the laws of God 
once they've once they've been saved that's dangerous Jesus told us that if we love him we will obey his commands and we acknowledge Jesus as who say it who's Jesus God say can everyone let's all say it. God God yeah Jesus is God and we acknowledge Jesus as God and he said if you love me obey my command and John 14 15 if you love me keep my commands people would argue but that's Old Testament law that was for the Jews not so fast Jesus never abolished those teachings. I just said he raised them to a higher side. He corrected misteachings. You know, we've talked about this before. I, this is important for you to remember um, because someone who doesn't know the Bible may try to argue with you when Jesus says, uh, you have heard it said this, but I tell you this. They say, well, see, Jesus even said part of the Old Testament was wrong. That's not what Jesus says. When a rabbi says, you have heard it said, he's not talking about what the scripture says. He's talking about what another rabbi I taught someone he's saying listen it was taught to you this way but here's what it means that's what Jesus is saying when you hear him say you have heard it said he's saying I know that rabbi taught you this he didn't teach it to you the right way here's what it means that's what that's what's happening in the Bible when Jesus says you have heard it said he's not saying oh that Old Testament stuff's wrong here's the way it should be no 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 that's not what's happening whenever you hear that so it is, he never abolished Old Testament teachings. He did correct them. Theologically speaking, by the way, on that topic, there are different uh, types of commands in Old Testament law. Um, there's a word, if you've, there's this word antinomianism. Uh, yeah, it's antinomianism. It means this school of thought that Christians are no longer subject to the Old Testament teachings, including, in many, in most cases, the Ten Commandments. That's the school of thought that I'm going against today using Scripture. And as we go, I'm going to prove it to you. The rationale is that Jesus came, and therefore, we just we only observe what he says. Yeah, you know, that's it. No Old Testament. Because people like to conveniently forget that Jesus is God, and God was involved in the affairs of the Old Testament. They still count. When observing God's laws, as, as they were first given to the Jews, there were ceremonial laws, dietary laws, civil laws, moral laws. Um, but the first three, ceremonial, dietary, and civil, were laws structured to govern a specific behavior, a set of disciplines and the lifestyle of set apart for God's chosen people, for the Jews. There's actually six... He, six 613 of them, not just 10, which is a lot. They were a very legalistic society. But when we get to the last category, not dietary, not ceremonial, it's the last category is moral laws. And that category is the Ten Commandments, the laws that exemplify the nature of God. Now, God does not abolish anything he has given to us to show his character, his nature, and his desire for us. For him to go against, God would not go against himself. Moral laws are not culturally bound. These are moral laws. They're not, they're not bound to a culture. That's why they're used across the entire world as the basis for all law, because we recognize them as moral law. So, you're, if... You think, you know, the pastor's harping on this, and <laughs> we got to go by the Ten Commandments, and, and why would people teach otherwise? I'm going to tell you, because you're probably going to hear it if you haven't already heard it. Maybe you're one of the people that believe it. I hope not. But when people teach this wrong, here's where they get it. They usually use uh, the book of Romans in chapter 7, 1 through 6. And I'm going to read to you what that says. It says, do you not know, brothers and sisters, I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives? For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he's alive, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law, and that, that, that binded her to him. So then, if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she's called an adulteress, but if he dies... She's released from that law, and she's not an adulteress if she marries another man. So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you may belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, 
The sinful possessions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruits for death. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Here's the problem with teaching that that means you don't have to follow the Ten Commandments. Those laws that Paul was talking about were for those of us, who are all of us, who lived in the flesh. Not us, not, not because through Jesus now we live in the Spirit. Since Jesus came, the old law is dead. That's what Paul is saying. And it is. And we rely solely on him. This is how they, th this part is what they teach. We rely solely on him for guidance and his grace covers our sins. The Ten Commandments are a great moral code, but you don't have to worry too much about it. Your sins are covered by Jesus. He is the law of Moses. If you're a Christian, you won't break those commandments anyway because the Spirit will guide you. Poppycock, that's not true. That's not true at all. You will break them and you do break them and so do I. We all, break the, we all break the Ten Commandments. We don't want to. That's why we need constant Jesus. That's why we need constant fellowship. That's why we need constant eternal thinking and forgiveness. Jesus dying for you. That teaching, here's that teaching is wrong. That teaching is wrong because Jesus dying on the cross did not make you perfect. And it did not make me perfect. But it gave us access to his perfection. And his perfection covers us. It didn't make us perfect. It gave us access to his perfection because he stood in our place. He paid the price for us at the cross. Here's the correct teaching of that, of that verse. <clears throat> this verse is telling us that we're no longer bound to the law in the sense that we're not subject to the punishment. We're not subject to the punishment of breaking the law because we are dead in the flesh. In other words, in other words we now live in Christ. We died to the flesh and are born again into the spirit. We all know that. We've all heard that. We all understand what that means. Now, when Paul says in that verse I just read to you, the old law is dead to us. He's not saying the Ten Commandments don't matter. He's not saying the Ten Commandments are dead to us. It means that it should no longer prompt us to desire to break it because he, ref he referred to its alluring power to dare the sinful heart has been defeated by Christ. That's why, that's why he said, it, it, you know, people break the, break the Ten Commandments because it has a power over you. When you get a rule, you know you want to break it because it just it, it eats at you if you don't. The, human, the evil human heart. Christ paid the price for us at the cross for breaking all, most of these commandments, and we were reborn into him. So we are dead to serving the punishment of the fleshly law. And when I pull that chart up in a little bit and expand on this, you're going to see a lot more clearly. We died to the world. We died to paying the price for breaking those commandments. We did not die to the standards of God. We died to suffering the penalty of breaking those laws. We didn't die to those being the standards of God. God doesn't change. He doesn't change in his character, and he doesn't change in his standards. Otherwise, after Jesus died, God would have said, all right, Bill's clean, go do what you want. You're all square now. <laughs> No, you're not. No, I'm not. Let's look at how the commandments show us the character of God. If you, if you start out, you could put that chart up. Oh, this is the handout, essentially. Wow, that's kind of tiny, isn't it? Okay. Well, the first commandments, the first four commandments address our relationship with God. No other gods, no idols, don't take the Lord's name in vain, observe the Sabbath. I, do you think he's changed his mind on any of those? No, he hasn't. The next six address, six address our relationships to one another. Obey your parents, don't murder, no adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, and don't covet. And now, there is one notable addition to this uh, in coveting. Coveting is an interesting one. You see how there's a line there? Oh, by the way, these are all the places in the Bible that state you get the death penalty for breaking these. These are where you find that in the Bible. Those scriptures are where you find the truth that if you break any of these, death penalty. That's what you get. Except this one. Because this commandment is the only commandment in all of the 1613 Jewish commandments that legislates thought. No other commandment legislates thought. Only actions. They can't prove what you're thinking, so they can't put you to death. 
But the interesting caveat about the 10th commandment, I know this is more like, sounds like a classroom today, but there's life applications. Stick with me. We're, we're going to get to it at the end. Um, the, the interesting thing about the not coveting thing is that if you follow that rule, it prevents you from breaking commandments 6 through 9. Because 6 through 9 are largely caused by coveting. Coveting is what leads to breaking the previous four commandments. It's the precursor to murder, stealing, adultery, theft. When you covet, you want something that someone else has. You'll die, lie, steal, cheat, to kill, to get it. Because that's what covet means. Which, incidentally, that's, that's another misconception about covet. Covet doesn't mean you just want something really badly. I want, man, I really, really want that. I really want Bob's house. Man, Bob has a nice house, and I really wish I had a house. Sometimes that can be good if it prompts you to work harder to, to, to get a house like Bob's. If you, and if you say, Bob's, Bob's wife's beautiful. I wish I had a beautiful wife. That's okay, as long as you're not lusting after Bob's wife. Now, you can get into envy and lust, which will walk you right to the front door of coveting. Coveting in the Bible, in the Ten Commandments, what was written in the Hebrew, the word, uh, the word is uh, lach, you know how they have that letter? <laughs> lach mode, lach mode. And it means, it means to plot and to seek something that someone has, to make it your own and to take it away from another person. So it's not just you want it. You are seeking. You are plotting. I don't just want a house like Bob's. I want his house. I want his wife. That's coveting. That's what coveting is in the 10th commandment. Thou shalt not covet. That's why it goes through the whole list. Don't take something from another person. Don't plot. Don't scheme. Don't. And we know lust and envy, although they're not the 10 commandments, they take you right up. The, they go, here, meet my friend, covet. <laughs> and they will walk you down that path to where you can start. You will start coveting. They're dangerous and destructive. So, but that's what coveting uh, actually is. And that's, that's interesting. It's the only one that legislates thought, but if you, if you abide by that commandment, you avoid all the other commandments. Don't plot and scheme to get something. That is another person's. It doesn't just mean that you want something really, really bad. <clears throat> well, here's a takeaway. Whether you still believe it or not, you're under the Ten Commandments. There's the chart. Can everyone see the chart, or does everyone have a handout? Because this is important. Do you, if you can't see the chart, you okay. Okay, now Jesus said, obey my commands. We acknowledge that Jesus is God, and God will not go against himself or his character. Therefore, Jesus, God, gave the Ten Commandments. And I, I, as I keep repeating, he didn't, Jesus never downplayed or diminished Old Testament teachings. He raised them to a higher standard. In the chart on the screen, you see a list of places where the New Testament reinforces the teachings of the commandments. All those scriptures are, are where they're re-emphasized in the new. You can see how long this would have been if I would have broken this out into a, would have had to have been a three-week course in Bible study. Every one of those verses re-emphasizes the commandment from the Old Testament. And under every one of those verses are verses where Jesus expands on re-emphasizing those commandments. God doesn't change and neither does his character. It didn't change from then to then. might be worded. In fact, it was, it was more greatly emphasized. The sensibilities and the principles. Jesus didn't say, thou shalt not. Jesus basically said, here's why. Here's why. That's what, that's what Jesus is doing. That's what the New Testament is doing. We're not subject to the punishment of breaking the Ten Commandments. If you've accepted Christ and his sacrifice, that's why you're dead to the old law, because your flesh is dead to the old law. You're dead to the punishment. If you ask if, you ask if you're subject to the Ten Commandments, I, I would recommend you, you, you look up all those, all those principles and sensibilities on the right from the New Testament, which is just another way of saying... The Ten Commandments. <laughs> That's really what it is. So the life application is keep the commandments, keep the commandments in your view at all time. If you have a Jesus painting in your house or those folded prayer hands or, uh, you know, a crocheted Jesus standing at the door, behold, I knock. Good. Look at all that stuff. Get a, get a copy of the Ten Commandments and hang them somewhere too. Keep a set of them somewhere in view. <laughs> Because Paul explained that knowing the commandments is what causes a person to break them. Because people want to do what they're not supposed to do. And that's what he was talking about when he, when he was talking about 
the allure of the law. But since Christ died for the sins we have committed in breaking those commandments, I think it's a good idea to keep them in view. And in, well, obviously more importantly in your heart, to remember what Jesus paid the price for. God said, don't do this. This is going to happen to you if you do this. We've done most of these things. But we got out without doing this. We skated. Because Jesus died and said, here's why you shouldn't do these things. You have access to my perfection now. Because you couldn't be perfect. You can now access my perfection. That's what that is. Jesus paid the debt for breaking them. Our duty is to try and stop breaking them. What do you say? If you love me, you keep my commands. No matter how you slice it, no matter how you slice it, you can you, you read all these, guess where it brings you right back to? Right here. Because every one of these are just a condensed way of saying the teachings of Jesus. That's what they are. If you look at, if you look at the Ten Commandments like a math problem, I always tell this to atheists. You... Just f follow it through to its conclusion from the scientific method. If every person on the earth followed the Ten Commandments, what would the world be like? It would be, it would be paradise. It would be utopia. There would be, oh my gosh, the world would be a paradise. Just imagine if everyone followed those Ten Commandments. That's how you know it's of God. I, I would think that if you lived back in the Old Testament times... You're given these Ten Commandments right here, right? Law, of, they call it the Law of Moses, it's the Law of God. That they would have had to have looked at these and say, Hey, uh, Moses, listen, yeah, well, these laws you gave, hey, the penalty for this is death. And I know personally there is no one I know that hasn't broken at least one or two of those. So that can't be. You can't, we can't have laws that are going to put us to death because if we do, how are we going to live? Exactly. How are you going to live if you cannot live up to this? You're not. Unless somebody steps in and takes that for you. And somebody did. That's why it, I'm just mystified as to how Old Testament Jews couldn't have seen what Jesus did and went, oh, wow, now I get it. Now it makes sense. There is no way we could all live like that. That's perfection. We needed someone to take care of this for us. These death sentences. Because we can't do it on our own. I can't believe they didn't recognize the validity of the divinity of Jesus Christ being the Messiah just based on that. Those are impossible rules. Not to go too far down a rabbit hole, but just like the story of the Good Samaritan. I did a whole sermon on that. Everybody thinks it's about being nice and helping other people. That's the smallest part of that sermon. That sermon's about the impossibility of you being like the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan is Jesus. And we can't be like him. We're incapable of it. That's why we need Christ. We are to seek to be like that. We can't do it. We are to seek it. The penalty for breaking these is death. No person alive could live a life and not break one of those. That means everyone is deserving of what? Death. Say death. 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 Yeah, everyone's deserving of death. We can only live if someone else pays the, pro the, the price, and someone did. Our punishment for breaking them is paid. People that say, people that anyone would teach you, you're not subject to these Ten Commandments. You, get, you keep this chart, stick it on your refrigerator, write it down, take a picture, I don't care. Just try to remember it because it's all right there in black and white. These are all scriptures that support this, this school of thought, this reality, this truth. That whether you want to call them the Ten Commandments or the teachings of Jesus or the rules and the laws of God, you can call them whatever you want, but we're all still subject to them. And we got out of this... This is, uh, this is how we're ending this. We, we, we got out of this because of Jesus Christ. So what do you think about every day? Why do I say, you got some Ten Commandments, put them up in your house. They're in front of courtrooms. Because it's not just to remember, this is how I want to live. It's because the ultimate thing to remember is, is what you're living for worth what Jesus died for.